In today's lecture, I want to look at uh, three figures, three designers uh, who really exemplify the, the changing relationship between building performance on the one hand and building fabrication and assembly on the other. Uh, these three all looked at the processes of uh, making things out of materials and the, the, especially the sort of recent advances in industrialization, some of the new materials that we've already looked at in particular, uh, aluminum, and finding ways to apply these as we'll see not only to architectural applications, but to furniture applications at one end of the scale and to urban and even global applications uh, at the other. Um, these names might be vaguely familiar. Bucky Fuller uh, in particular uh, is, became famous for his geodesic domes, which we'll look at toward the end of the lecture, uh, but was also an outstanding self-promoter uh, and, and therefore um, was able to play the kind of publicity game very well and to get his ideas across uh, at what passed for massive scale uh, in, the, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, Charles and Ray Eames may be a little bit less familiar, but you almost certainly have at least sat on one of their chairs. Uh, we'll show a few of those, and some of them will probably look familiar. The furniture that they developed became ubiquitous in the post-war era. They had a relationship to architecture that was interesting. They uh, designed and built really only one structure, but uh, they had designs for others and their approach, even if it focused on things outside the architectural realm, things like furniture, film, set design, exhibition design, uh, they nevertheless were architectural in their approach in ways that I hope to show uh, were, uh, were, were important and were related to the sort of things that, that Bucky Fuller was doing. And then finally, uh, a figure from France who probably isn't familiar, but who should be, uh, for some of the same reasons that these other two are, Jean Prouvé, uh, who took a very particular approach to fabricating new materials that resonates quite clearly, I think, with some of the topics that we've uh, been looking at in the, in the last week or two. So I'm going to start with Fuller. I'm going to split Fuller's career in two, a sort of early career uh, and a late career. Uh, Fuller's early career really resonates with those of the Eames and of Prouvé, and we'll come back around to Fuller at the end and talk about uh, how, how his career really sort of blossomed in the, in the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, Fuller uh, is a fascinating figure, and there are literally hundreds of books uh, on uh, his career and his philosophy, some of them quite skeptical, and I think in some cases deservedly so. As I said, he was uh, a, a, a shameless publicist, self-publicist, uh, and this not only helped his career, but I think it's also left uh, some, some important questions about just exactly uh, what he achieved and who else may have been responsible for, for helping with some of that. Um, he was from a, a, an absolute blue blood New England family. Uh, his, he was the grand nephew of a, a transcendentalist philosopher named Margaret Fuller. The Fuller family was uh, quite wealthy. They lived in Milton, Massachusetts, uh, and sent uh, young Bucky to Harvard, where he was expelled not once but twice. <laughs> Um, he then sort of puttered around for a while, spending the family money, served some time in the Navy uh, during World War I, uh, and married well, married a woman named Ann Hewlett in 1917. Um, despite being from a wealthy family, despite having all of the kind of advantages uh, of life, uh, their daughter died of meningitis in 1922, and this deeply, deeply affected uh, Fuller. He lamented the fact that even with the advances that had occurred up to that point, uh, a disease that today we find uh, preventable uh, had, had taken the life of his daughter. He blamed sort of poor sanitation in their house, poor hygiene, things that naturally came with some of the limitations in, in old houses and, and old cities. Um, that, you could argue, psychologically led to this desire of his to transform the building industry, right? If you blame buildings for the death of your daughter, uh, you're very likely to want to turn around and, and fix the problem uh, in any way you can. Um, he briefly, for a few years, worked with his father-in-law to try to uh, market a, a, a building system that would have used rammed earth blocks. They called it the stockade system. Um, it failed miserably, uh, despite, despite their best efforts. Um, he moved to Chicago. Uh, he and Anne had a second daughter in 1927. And uh, Fuller describes having this uh, sort of transcendental moment 
uh, wondering whether he could support this young family, thinking that maybe the world would be better off without him on a walk uh, alongside Lake Michigan. And instead, after a year of silence that we might interpret today as a, a, a nervous breakdown, uh, decides to rededicate himself to uh, finding solutions to the problems facing cities, facing populations, uh, facing people like uh, him and his wife, uh, who, had, who had lost their daughter to this, to this horrible disease. They moved back to New York in 1928. Fuller strikes up a friendship uh, with, among others, the designer Isamu Noguchi, uh, and begins a long series of collaborations that will lead to uh, visionary ideas, some of them achievable, some of them not. Um, and the, the earliest ones of these look uh, genuinely naive. Uh, and, and in some ways, you know, these are almost the sort of scribblings uh, of, a, of a middle schooler, but they show Fuller's kind of passion, his idea and his, his ideas and his awareness uh, of the technology that, that was out there, if maybe not a full understanding of what it was actually capable of. Um, his initial idea after Stockade uh, was to go big and to redesign basically the entire housing industry. These sketches are for a, a project that he called the 4D Tower, or the 4D House. Um, the idea was that it would be a, a, a prefabricated metal uh, structure that had a, a sort of central compression core, tension cables on the outside uh, holding up the floors. Each floor would have been an apartment unit. Uh, and they it would have relied on a hexagonal shape for efficiency, both structural and, and programmatic. Um, and as you see, would have used cranes and things like this to, to move uh, cargo in and out of the, the apartments. On the left, you see what he called his 4D strategy map, which uh, proposed dropping these towers by airship uh, all over the world. And you can see that in addition to Africa, North America, Europe, there's a 4D tower uh, right on the, the North Pole. Um, a lot of these uh, sort of walk a fine line between visionary and the kind of ravings of, of a lunatic. Uh, but Fuller, being a publicist, publicist um, was able to convince uh, Marshall Fields, the Chicago department store, uh, to commission and build a model of a much smaller scheme that he called the Demaxian House. And you can think of this as one floor of the 4D tower and one that was sort of reasonably within the realm of, of possibility. Fuller never took it past the model stage. He seemed much more interested in the, the kind of attention that he got from newspapers and magazines uh, for this idea of a, of a truly modern house. And if you look at the, the time frame, the late 1920s, you know, this is when Corbusier is talking about the Maison Domino. This is when Mies is talking about uh, glass skyscrapers. This is when there's a lot of uh, sort of energy surrounding the, this idea that all of this new technology that's come online, first for the steam engine and then the locomotive and now the automobile and the airplane, that all of this might be transferred somehow to architecture. And you begin to see a lot of uh, complaints basically about how antiquated the building industry is uh, and how it should learn from all of these newer industries that have had greater uh, cost or weight pressures uh, that have been able to advance fabrication much farther than uh, than architecture and building. Um, Fuller coins this term demaxian, dynamic maximum. Um, and like a lot of Fuller's terms, it means kind of everything and it means nothing uh, all at once. It's a, it's a, a catchy uh, phrase. For Fuller, it means doing the most with the least. In other words, trying to find radical efficiencies in the way that you fabricate, assemble, uh, and occupy uh, buildings. So you can see here that the Demaxian house has a compression mast, so limiting the, the amount of compression in the structure. The rest of the house is held up by tension cables. Uh, and Fuller's idea is that you can put all of the risers, all of the plumbing, all of the services into that central mast. You can do it as a sort of prepackaged thing that shows up on the site. Okay, maybe not by airship, but this time by, uh, by truck uh, and limit the amount of on-site building time to, to complete the house. That never quite works, never quite takes off. Uh, Fuller goes on to sort of populate the Demaxian world with a number of other uh, inventions and maybe most famous, but also most notorious is the Demaxian car which is a three-wheeled car that he sees as taking the, the same uh, obsession with efficiency that had gone into the house and putting it into the automotive industry. And this is one of hundreds of uh, automotive kind of startups that happens 
uh, in the 20s and 30s. Fuller's not unusual in, in trying to, to build a better uh, automobile. This one, though, comes with a, a kind of built-in uh, publicity program, and you can see it here on the left at the 1933 Century of Progress exhibition in front of another uh, modernist house, Keck and Keck's uh, Crystal House, which was one of the sensations uh, of, the, of the exhibition. Fuller works not only with Noguchi, but also with a yacht designer, Starling Burgess, who's a, a, another good friend of his. And so you get this idea that Burgess brings the idea of radical efficiency. If you're designing yachts, then weight uh, is at a, at a premium, much more so than it would be in building. Noguchi is brought in basically as the, the aesthetic designer, the sculptor, who's going to give the, the car its form. And you can see that it has a, a streamlined form that would have been very, uh, very au courant uh, uh, in, in, the, in the day. Um, the car, unfortunately, uh, is involved in a fatal auto accident. Uh, it's driving passengers, ironically, to, uh, to meet uh, an airship that's coming in for the, the, uh, the Century of Progress exhibition. Uh, the driver is killed, the two passengers are badly hurt, and it happens right at the entrance to the fair where there are lots of photographers uh, who capture the, the, the aftermath. And, and the Damaxian car as a project uh, is basically done uh, after that. So Fuller has now failed a number of times, and uh, a, a lot of people I think would probably have packed it up and, and gone home uh, after this string of, of failures. Um, but Fuller, nevertheless, is, is really dogged. Uh, during World War II, um, he goes to work for the government, uh, an agency that is uh, helping to procure supplies for the military. And he takes the Damaxian idea and basically uh, puts the idea onto what we might call a ready-made. He notices that corrugated metal grain bins are being manufactured uh, all over the country for agricultural purposes. Uh, and he basically takes a standard grain bin, uh, puts a couple of windows and a door in it, and says, aha, like here is the Damaxian house. It is already mass produced. It already has a kind of industry uh, surrounding it with a couple of small changes to the, to the jigs in the factory. Uh, we can turn these grain bins into what he calls Damaxian deployment units. So he uh, basically says that these could be used for, for military purposes. Um, he successfully gets a patent for it, which is uh, almost bizarre given that this is a product that already exists. His patent, though, is about uh, a ready-made dwelling unit. And you can see here some of the very, very simple uh, structural ideas that uh, that he borrows. Um, the military does go ahead and, and buy some of these. Uh, Fuller is involved in the in the procurement uh, of them. And uh, after the war is over, Fuller is one of the people who realizes that there is this tremendous kind of uh, excess industrial energy. Uh, the United States has geared up dramatically to produce all of the wartime material, the tanks and the planes and the ships and the armament uh, that have gone into fighting a, a, a global uh, conflict. Um, all of that industry has employed people. All of that industry has uh, made connections to materials, to transport networks. Uh, again, there is a kind of ready-made right there. And Fuller, among many others, uh, sort of wonders how all of that capacity might be put to, to new use, to better use. And he is not the only one to understand that the end of the war is also going to bring a huge demographic boom. As soldiers come home, they start families, uh, there are going to be many, many, many more people in the 1950s and 1960s uh, in the United States than there were in the 1930s and 1940s. Fuller takes all of the idea, these ideas uh, and combines them. He goes to Wichita, Kansas, and he works with the Beechcraft Company, uh, a company that has made small aircraft uh, for years, but has uh, really ramped up production uh, to make small military uh, aircraft during World War II. And he says, look, you have the connections to uh, aluminum and to steel and to glass and to all of these other materials that have gone into airplanes. You have the fabrication potential to make all of these kind of complex uh, aeronautical shapes, and you have distribution networks. Instead of manufacturing hundreds of thousands of planes, which no one is going to have any use for, why don't we make hundreds of thousands of houses? And Fuller uh, initially successfully works with the Beechcraft Company to develop uh, what is called the Wichita House from 1944 uh, to 1946. 
And this, as you can see, has several uh, similarities to the two previous Damaxian projects. It has a central compression mast. It has a central kind of core for the services. Uh, and it has a suspension system that holds up the exterior. At the same time, uh, it relies on some of the geometry and some of the, the uh, fabrication that went into the grain bins, the, the Damaxian uh, deployment units. Um, this is a, a kind of mashup, right? It's all of these ideas that he's had about housing before. There's a ready-made sitting right there, aircraft manufacturer that's desperately looking for uh, new markets. Uh, he sort of puts two and two together and comes up with this, uh, this idea to, again, radically recreate the, the housing industry. They build prototypes. They set up a factory that will make all of the pieces uh, for, the, for the house out of uh, aluminum and steel, both of which now have uh, excess capacity uh, after World War II. Um, this is the entire house structure on the right in a package that can be put into a cylindrical container that you see on the left, uh, all put onto a truck uh, and delivered to, to a job site uh, and assembled in, in a couple of days, uh, as you see on the right. Fuller gives this uh, incredibly energetic speech called Designing a New Industry, some of which is in the, um, the, the, the reading for this week. And the project is all sort of ready to go. Uh, but Fuller obsesses about distribution and obsesses about details um, and essentially holds up the project uh, almost in interminably, keeps coming up with reasons that they can't actually go live. And there are probably good psychological reasons for this, but ultimately the project fails because Fuller cannot get the, the house out the door. Um, three of these prototypes are built. One of them is in the Henry Ford Museum in Michigan, uh, but, but Fuller loses the opportunity basically to enter what will in fact become one of the largest construction markets uh, in, the, in the world, the post-war uh, housing industry uh, in the United States. This in many ways marks the kind of end of Fuller's career as an industrialist. Uh, he is seen as a, a dreamer, a visionary, but someone who again has failed over and over and over. Uh, and he has a hard time basically uh, getting industry to answer his calls after the, the Wichita House debacle. We'll come back to him at the end of the lecture and talk about how in this dogged way that he has, uh, he reinvents himself again, uh, learns somewhat from the, the failure of the Wichita House, retreats, uh, and thinks about some of the same issues but instead of on a kind of detail or building scale on a much larger uh, global scale. In the meantime, I wanna look at his contemporaries, uh, Prouvé and the Eameses, and show how they were looking at some of the same issues that went into the Wichita house. Uh, how do you take what we know about fabrication from these other industries uh, and apply them to new ways of thinking about, uh, about architecture? Prouvé uh, is uh, born in, in north uh, northeastern France, uh, which is part of the, the European Iron Range. So there is a, a developed steel industry uh, that is already uh, there, and Prouvé is born into a family uh, that has, has really uh, been a part of that. Um, his father had been an artist, part of the Art Nouveau movement, uh, and the leader of this organization, the, the School of Nancy, a, a, a group, that wanted to connect art to society and to industry. And this is very much a spin-off uh, of the, the, uh, the, the, the societies that we talked about when we looked at the arts and crafts, trying to transform industry sort of early efforts at what today we would call industrial design. Um, he worked as a, a metal worker. He opened a studio in the early 1920s, 1923, right about the time that Mises is doing the glass skyscraper, Prouvé strikes out uh, on his own as an artisan. Uh, and he does sort of local commissions in, in what is the kind of standard issue uh, Art Nouveau style, but is very good at it and wins commissions uh, as far away as Paris, especially from modernists uh, like Mallory Stevens. Um, in 1931, he expands this into uh, both a design studio and a, a larger factory and does what today we would call industrial design. He designs bicycles, uh, portable stoves, uh, things like this. And he begins to work on not just building components, gates and things, uh, but whole prefabricated sheds. Uh, and in particular for these two architects, Baudouin and Lodes, who get at first aviation commissions. So Prouvé sees 
the, uh, the up close and, and personal, the, the aircraft that are inspiring others, and also on furniture designs in Corbusier's uh, circle. Um, this leads eventually, as we'll see, to cladding design. So he designs components for curtain walls, again, a new technology in the, in the 1930s. And using some of that technology, uh, basically expanding the curtain wall business again into, into prefabrication, uh, both for uh, houses and, as we'll see, for, uh, for uh, public, public structures. World War II, again, is uh, very influential in his career. The military gives him commissions for shelters that uh, he builds, very much like Fuller. But instead of finding a ready-made, Prouvé thinks of things from kind of first principles. And in fact, um, Prouvé was an active member of the French Resistance, so he actually fought in World War II. He shut his studio uh, and, and went to work basically uh, fighting for the, the, uh, the, the, the freedom of, uh, of France. And in his early work, you see very competent, you know, very, very good Art Nouveau uh, detailing. So these are all uh, metalsmith works that he does around Nancy, this industrial town in northeastern France. Um, nothing there that looks like it's going to be, you know, particularly revolutionary. Um, but in his uh, work in the 1930s, he begins to look at simplifying the processes for manufacturing. And here on the left, one of his chairs, maybe his most famous one, um, where he's using wood and sheet steel uh, to create components that can be made relatively easily uh, and then bolted together simply. And this is a prototype for uh, a school chair that um, ended up taking off, right? Uh, manufactured initially to be inexpensive, to be mass produced, but one that has, in part because of those restrictions, uh, a, a certain aesthetic to it. And on the right, you can see a lounge chair where he's using bar stock and again, sheet steel uh, to create relatively simple fabrications that can be done with a couple of operations in the shop, uh, put together with the, the other uh, materials uh, and shipped out relatively quickly. Prouvé worked uh, almost exclusively in sheet steel instead of uh, in, in rolled tubes. And this was unusual uh, for, for uh, metal design uh, of his day. He said that sheet steel allowed him, he said, to fold joint score uh, and weld it, which made uh, areas of sort of predictable strength, uh, but also he could control the quality of the, of the finish much better. So rolled steel, of course, has slightly rough surfaces. Sheet steel, Prouvé could get kind of as smooth as, as he wanted. And so he's thinking about the way that manufacturing processes lead to finished material qualities and how to best exploit these uh, in, in furniture design and eventually in, in building design. So here is one of these early club buildings for uh, an aviation building at uh, Roland Garros, which before it is a tennis stadium, is a, an airfield uh, in, in Western Paris. And you can see that, that um, Prouvé is working with sheet steel both as a cladding element uh, but also as a structural element. The columns there are bent steel sheets instead of being rolled sections. And you get a hint in the lower right of the, the finish quality uh, of that steel versus what we're used to uh, in, in, in rolled material. I think it's unquestionable that Prouvé is inspired by the lightweight, by the sort of uh, tensile nature of early aircraft. And this is a, a building that's trying in a way to sort of live up to the tectonics of the planes that, that he must have seen around him. And Prouvé's most famous work of the 1930s is uh, this public building, uh, a sort of village hall and market in Clichy, which is a, a suburb of Paris uh, that he does in 1936. And this is a, a fairly large scale uh, structure for one uh, factory basically to take on. And Prouvé fabricates essentially the whole thing. He contracts with a, a glass supplier, but everything else basically is steel that comes out of his atelier and out of his fabrication shop. Um, on the left, this is it uh, today, or at least a few years ago. And you can see it is all, literally all steel and glass. On the right, you see uh, his, the, the kind of general arrangement drawing that he does. The market hall in the middle with the um, triangular skylights, the office building, which is clad entirely in sheet steel on the right. And then you can see the, the structure that surrounds it. Here he's fine with, uh, with rolled steel. 
much of which is going to be uh, concealed, but some of which will be exposed. And, and as long he figures as he can get the cladding system and the interior partitions to have that fine quality that he likes, uh, he can live with the economics of, of rolled steel a bit. On the left, the, uh, the market hall, and you see exposed trusses, uh, but, but done in a way that is uh, just a step above maybe a, a typical industrial building, right? With some thought to creating a, a sort of monumental public space. And on the right, this very, very fine cladding system. Uh, in 1936, this is a curtain wall that is uh, incredibly elegant, given uh, a lot of the, uh, the other competitors maybe uh, of the time. And I think that comes from Prouvé's knowledge of the material. He's been working with steel his whole life. Uh, he knows how to bend it, fold it into shapes that will work structurally, but that also, uh, again, will take advantage of the, the finer finished qualities of, of sheet steel. And in particular, uh, the cladding detail on the office block is particularly clever. Um, this is all, again, steel sheet, um, but you can see that all of the panels have just this little kind of pillow shape to them. And this is Prouvé understanding that if the sheet is left kind of slack, uh, it'll bend in ways that will produce an effect called oil canning, where the reflections off of the, the, the sheet steel uh, will be distracting and, and make it seem a little bit flimsy. So the detail on the right, the far right, um, what he's showing here is a section through one of the cladding panels where he has uh, sheet steel on the inside and outside. And in the middle, he's welded little springs that uh, basically pre-tension the skin of the, the, the cladding panel uh, and give it this bowing out shape, right? That removes any possibility that the slack sheet is gonna bend or, or, or oil can. Uh, in ways that, 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 that he can't predict or can't control. Um, that to me reflects a real kind of knowledge of the, of the material uh, and the way it's going to work. And if you look at the edges of the panel in the detail, you can see that he's also put uh, a bend uh, at the, the, the uh, edge of the, the uh, steel. And that again is going to control the, the side uh, of, the, of the panel and give him a firm uh, edge that he can both um, connect to but also that visually is, is going to be satisfying uh, when, when, it's, uh, when it's exposed. When we come back, we'll look at Prouvé's late career uh, after World War II, uh, how he, like Fuller, takes some of the excess industrial capacity that is around him in France as France rebuilds. Prouvé applies that industrial capacity uh, not, not just to speculative housing, but to housing projects that are desperately needed uh, in a country that is trying to rebuild uh, after the devastation of the previous four years.